Uh, Christina, do you need to do a roll call or anything like that uh, to confirm quorum? No, I do not. I have it listed who is present. Okay. So that will be taken care of. Okay. Um, I wasn't at the November 4th meeting. Um, <clears throat> just so you know, and, and I'm not looking for sympathy, but th my dad had gone into the hospital and he passed away not short, not long after that. So that was the reason for my absence there. So, um, and it was good old, old age, uh, died peacefully with family around him. So it was a, while well, sad, it was a good, it was, uh, he wasn't alone. So, um, anyway, um, so if someone wants to, uh, move to approve the minutes from November 4th, I would hear that. So moved. Dr. Morris, second. Second, if you need it, Jace. I'm glad he unmuted. All right, uh, been moved and seconded all. Um, approve the minutes as presented in your meeting materials. Uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, aye. same sign. Minutes approved. Okay, on to the uh, discussion of the day uh, pediatric vaccines and recommendations. Christina, do you want, do you have any background you want to provide first? That was actually the, the last agenda. This one. Oh, um, I'm sorry. It's okay. The next thing on the agenda is the update on the advisory board of health vacancies. Oh, I wanted okay. to let you guys sorry. know. I pulled up the wrong one here, I guess. It's okay. You brought up the minutes from last time. Yep. Um, the change to the board of health, um, its makeup was approved by the council in December okay. and went into effect mid-December, almost end of December. So we do have two board of health vacancies. It is now required that one of them be a mental health practitioner, but it is no longer required that they reside in independence nor that they own their independence business. They can just practice in independence or own the business or reside. Um, so I just wanted to make that known uh, if you guys wanted to. There are those two vacancies. Um, we do need to fill one with a mental health practitioner. Okay. And next is, of course, our discussion on COVID-19. I guess the question is, do we have some lot candidates that uh, we need to, to approach? Um, so there are two applications that I had sent um, probably, well, two months ago now. Um, we had also, I know that there had been discussion at one point about approaching comprehensive mental health, possibly um, Julie Pratt to see of her interest. At the time, I know that she had expressed it some interest. I'm not sure she still has it. Um, it is, you guys know best. You are the experts. Um, so you tell me who we should approach to fill that, that mental health slot. Jason here, I, I, you know, I think we ought to be as open and visible. Is there any way we could get uh, uh, at a council meeting uh, just 10 seconds of, of comment from the mayor or somebody saying there's uh, they've changed, they've adjusted the membership of the Board of Health and there are two slots open. One is for a mental health professional. And, you know, just to make sure that the community is aware of it. I mean, if people people that are interested in the community sort of watch the council meetings occasionally, and I don't know, maybe there's some other way of putting word out without making it too onerous. And as well as asking Julie, I mean, I, I, I'm not a fan of handpicking, you know, boards. Uh, the diversity is critical and, 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 and transparency. So I guess, is there a way we can let the community know we have two openings and one needs to be a mental health professional and you don't have, and the changes as you just indicated, as well as, as checking in with Julie since she has voiced interest. I'll go back on mute. I can definitely um, mention it, if nothing else, to the city clerk. Um, so I know that she does talk about uh, vacancies, board vacancies um, at the very end of course, most of the council meetings. 
I can see that if she will mention that, uh, I know that our PIO every once in a while does advertise that there are openings for different board vacancies. I can also ask if she will do that as one of our spotlights. We have a Mental Health Monday thing that we do for social media. Maybe part of that Focus One Monday will be that we are looking for a mental health practitioner to help serve on the board. I think that'd be a good way to go. It would let mental health practitioners here in the city be aware that we're interested in their input and also shows that the Board of Health is trying to focus on mental health and making that a priority and uh, that would expand our our uh, field of folks to choose from. So what's the, does their term start when they, when they're approved or do we, is there a, a, a kind of a timeline we need to kind of push here? So I would have to go back and look to see what two vacancies there are. Technically, anyone who would be approved would finish out the term of the person that they're, that made the vacancy. So for sometimes the initial term is only one year. And then after that, it's every, I believe, three years. Okay. Um, so I know sometimes when an individual joins, they're only a member for a year before they have to get it renewed. And some come on right towards the beginning and have, you know, a good full three years. I'd have to look at each of these to see how long each vacancy is still open for. But there is not, there's not a set deadline um, there's no, there's a requirement that you have a quorum of five in order to conduct meetings. Um, but we're not going to stop having meetings if you don't fill these two slots in the next month. Sure, I just wanted to understand what the bylaws did and, and create some uh, sense of urgency to to fill the position because it, as we all know there's a there's a pretty critical need to have someone with that level of expertise on the board to, to, to guide us in some of those areas. So that would be helpful. Christina, do you mind resending the current applications we have? I'm not sure if I still have those. Not a problem, I can resend. Yes, thank you. Any other discussion on the topic? I think, Christina, do you have enough uh, guidance here to go on initially? I do. Okay, cool. All right. So we'll move on then to a COVID update. I don't know if Dr. Morris wants to start or if you want me to answer some of the questions about um, our state of emergency. Um, I know there was also a question that was sent to me. Well, now I have to remember. Um, I guess I'll start with the, the first question I, I remember. Um, how the ending of the Missouri state of emergency has affected us. I can tell you that um, the governor's, of course, state of emergency ended on December 31st. What it meant for us on January 1st was our medical reserve corps. Um, we, we about got our medical reserve corps halved on how many could actually assist us at clinics because there was no longer a waiver uh, for, you know, licenses um, that had, you know, people who had retired or people who have, were licensed in Kansas, but helping us here on the Missouri side. Um, you know, there were waivers for EMT basics to do vaccines. There were waivers for vets to come and help us. Um, you know, all of those waivers expired. So suddenly we went from having all of these volunteers to still having those volunteers, but they they can't help us in the capacity that we need them to help us. Um, so that was one of the, the biggest impacts we had. We're, Christine, yeah, go I ahead. I was going to ask a question. Uh, my daughter who works for the state of Kansas, called me this afternoon to tell me that late this afternoon, the governor uh, passed yes. a resolution that didn't redeclare the state of emergency but put all of those actions back in for healthcare personnel. So people on retired licenses, uh, nurses on retired licenses, nurses from other states, 
could again do those jobs. Is there any possibility that uh, that might come from our governor? Have you heard anything about it? I have it? not heard anything. There is always a possibility, but I ha I have heard nothing. It's a good good thing for Kansas today. It it was. Um, the other thing I was asked about this is not COVID, uh, but I was asked about an uptake on the in status update on the intake center for comprehensive mental health um, and the mobile mental health program, the co-responder program that we have. Um, so real quick, comprehensive um, has formed a partnership, an alliance, been taken, I don't know how else to phrase it, with Burel, or Burel, Burel, there we go. Um, and I know they have a spot, they have a uh, crisis center down in Springfield and I'm sure they're quite large. They also have something uh, in Colorado. Comprehensive is now with them and they are now moving quickly. There was a building along Medical Center Parkway. So right by the old MCI that had previously been used for youth, teen, mental health um, work. They are repurposing it. Renovations are underway to have that as a temporary crisis intervention center. It's nowhere near as big as what they intend for their final product to be, but it's a good starting point to have something. Um, my understanding is they plan on having something up and running late spring is what I was told, that they should have all the renovations done and be ready to go. At this, In the same light, our team with the city is working on a co-responder program. I've met with um, the person who's trying to draft up the plan. He has met with Comprehensive. He has met with our dispatchers. He has worked with FIRE. He has He's talked with anyone and everyone he possibly can. He continues talking with more and more people. He's drafting it out and he's hoping by late spring, early summer to have a pilot program up and running. Um, and he's doing his best to make sure that that kind of corresponds with what Comprehensive has for their crisis center. So I know he's been talking with them a lot and working with them a lot. So that's good. It's moving and hopefully we'll have something happening soon. But then we can jump back to COVID-19, which I know is on everyone's mind and has taken over. Hey, Christine, Daryl Nelson, I just joined. Sorry, I was late, came over from another meeting. No, we're thrilled to have you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to share what I have. And I was glad Daryl showed up because I was anxious to hear what he had uh, to say. Uh, I think I'm, am I sharing now? Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see them. OK, um, it, it's been kind of a busy week. Uh, hopefully most of you uh, got the opportunity to watch the uh, statewide CMO medical community meeting that KU put on uh, yesterday, uh, about an hour and 15 minutes or so. They had chief medical officers from all the hospital chains in uh, Kansas and Almost all of them in the metro, uh, for some reason, St. Luke's wasn't available. Uh, it was uh, very information packed. Uh, this, this is today's data, which is actually uh, Monday's data, but anyway, uh, showing that uh, we are near and will soon pass the daily average cases. The peak we had before was in November uh, of 2020 at uh, 216 per day. And on Monday, we were putting in 214 uh, per day in the metro. Uh, oh, actually, this is, I guess, uh, two slides. Oh, that was the new cases. Uh, this is the daily hospitalizations, and we did pass with daily hospitalizations. The previous peak was in December of 2020, 191 a day. And uh, the metro area, as of Tuesday, was admitting 202 per day. Uh, so we're actually admitting more patients uh, than we ever have before. Uh, luckily, these, I, I, that's weird to say, luckily, these are younger people. Uh, the death rate is significantly less than what it was before because these are younger people. 
but these are people who are still sick enough to require hospitalization. So obviously it's not a good thing. Uh, this is for if you just carve out Eastern Jackson County, where as of Tuesday, we were admitting 30 per day uh, for the four hospitals that report from Eastern Jackson County. Our previous average high was 22 in November of 2020. Uh, it's I'm sure uh, Dr. Nelson will be able to tell us that it's not a fun place to be at the moment. This data is from KU as of this morning. They had 96 active COVID cases in the hospital. Eight of them were vaccinated, 88 were not vaccinated. Uh, there were 96 active, 19 were in the ICU. Of those in the ICU, 95% uh, were unvaccinated. They had 11 on, on ventilators uh, and 100% of those were unvaccinated. Mercy's numbers from this morning, they have 35 inpatients this morning. Uh, that's the highest they've ever had. The previous high was 22. Uh, they have 35 COVID patients. They have four flu patients. Uh, and these are patients in which COVID is the reason for admission. They're not children that got admitted for a broken bone or tonsillitis and also had tested positive for uh, COVID. These are folks that are in the hospital because they had COVID. Uh, interesting stuff on the COVID variants. Uh, it's kind of hard to sort all of this out, uh, but KU said today that North Kansas City reported uh, last week or earlier this week that in their wastewater, about 60% of the COVID uh, is Omicron, which means 40% is still uh, a Delta variant. Uh, this is from our, the city's most recent web page. Uh, the data is from uh, December 16th through the 29th. Uh, at that point in time, we were running 24% positivity. Uh, I can we, go uh, ahead and say we we are at 35% positivity yeah. now. Um, staff yeah. need to get that updated today, but yeah. yeah. And, the, and the challenge with all of this is uh, when my son-in-law tested positive this week, he says, how do I make sure this gets counted? And I said, well, the best thing I can think of is call your provider and there'll be a reporter and they will let the health department know. But you can't imagine, I mean, you can't buy a home test anymore. Uh, so you can't imagine how many of those people who test positive don't report it. So the, the positivity rate is significantly higher than, than what we're looking at. Um, uh, unfortunately, during that time, um, I think it was on there somewhere, you had four deaths, which was very worrisome over those two weeks. Um, and, and Dr. Nelson can certainly talk about that. The impact on hospital services is tremendous. We have a staff shortage because people are getting sick with COVID or they're exposed to COVID uh, and people are leaving the healthcare professions in droves. So there may be physical hospital beds that aren't hospital beds because you don't have anybody to take care of those people. Uh, I heard somebody in the grocery store complaining that they had to wait in the ER for two and a half hours uh, the other day, and it's because there are patients who are waiting tens of hours in the ER waiting for a bed to open so that they can go upstairs and get care. Uh, there's just not staff beds. KU canceled 50% of their OR schedule today because there was no place to put them after they operated on them. This is an interesting slide from yesterday's uh, KU presentation from Richard Warner, who is the co-founder of a company that makes a software called Mission Control that rural hospitals make to uh, assist them getting patients to a uh, tertiary care. Not every hospital in uh, Muleshoe, Kansas can do everything. And so they need some way uh, to get that, uh, help get those patients in. And uh, the slide that, if you if you're, can see it, it's in the left-hand corner here. Uh, the difference between November of 21 and December of 21, there was a 500% increase in people who died waiting to get transferred to a tertiary care center. So if you're having a heart attack and need a cath and that little hospital can't do your cath, you may die before you get a bed to go to. And we're seeing that with strokes and uh, other kinds of, of problems. It it's, was a pretty, pretty sobering uh, 
data to show. This is the uh, Eastern Jackson County uh, vaccination rate. Uh, according to the MARC data, uh, we run a little behind the overall population, which is about 99% fully vaccinated or about 83% fully vaccinated over 65, but that's also why our death rate is less. If you look at the 18 to 64 vaccination rate, that's about 59% uh, fully vaccinated, but that means there's 41% of folks who are not and uh, are at risk for getting more significantly ill. Uh, if you look at the 12 to 17 year olds, about 43% are fully vaccinated. And then if you look at the five to 11 year olds, we're running about 14% uh, that are fully vaccinated. Uh, Dr. Stites this morning ended his presentation with a phrase which uh, I took to heart. He said, we need to give grace and find courage, give grace and have difficult conversations that we don't want to have, and find the courage to do the right thing and to listen to those who really know what they're talking about. And that's all I got to say. Unshare here. Happy to answer any questions that anybody might have, but you all probably know all that already. Dr. Well, Nelson, can... yeah. I was going to say, Dr. Nelson, can you yeah. tell us what's happening at Center Point? Hmm. Sure, yeah. I appreciate Terry's update and uh, uh, have to tip my hat to Dr. Seitz. He's uh, kept uh, what started out as a very informal kind of almost support group for the citywide CMOs um, together through all of this, in addition to all the work he's doing community facing. And so uh, so we have a, a call at least once, if not twice a week, and, and we run our system numbers and we vet all the issues and challenges we're all collectively facing. The, the stories are still remarkably uh, similar as far as kind of the state of um, our respective health systems and, and the challenges being faced are um, incredibly similar and, and difficult. So I, I guess just for a quick reference, uh, Center Point's licensed at 285 beds. Most hospitals operate around 70 or 75% of their licensed bed status um, in a relatively busy time, to be honest. And uh, we're staying consistently between um, 260 and 285. We bypassed our, our licensed bed status a couple of times uh, transiently in the past few weeks. I think we're at 275 um, today. Of those, um, 69 acutely uh, ill with COVID. Um, 10 of those, um, 69 are in the ICU. Uh, there's 13 ventilated patients in our 26 bed ICU this afternoon. I think about half of those um, were, well, not quite half, I guess. I think about 10 of those 13 are COVID um, patients. The others are ventilated for other reasons. Um, in addition to the 69 active or 68 active uh, COVID patients, we have a le what we call a legacy 11. So there's almost 80 patients out of our 280 uh, inpatients who either currently have active COVID or at the 10 day phase and are still in our hospital for either complications from COVID or uh, other comorbid conditions that have been positive um, during their stay. Um, concurrently with that, we're seeing a doubling of absenteeism from our staff uh, about every three to five days. We were at about five or six um, as we got into the Christmas holiday. And I think we hit 49 um, out today with 17 more being tested. About half of our staff are coming back positive uh, for COVID. The other half probably have influenza or influenza-like illness or frankly are just ill from fatigue and burnout. Um, so that's just compounding the challenges we're having um, of managing the surge. Um, our system numbers for our six HCA hospitals uh, bypass 330 um, inpatients total um, today, which is uh, 80 or 90 past the highest system number for us from any of the three previous surges. And 
is unfortunately on a path to some internal company projections that um, our folks are working on that suggest we could um, push the upper fives to 600 by the, the first week of February. So that'll easily push us past um, our licensed bed status and we'll start pushing probably even the physical beds present in our hospital um, that aren't currently staffed that we could technically overflow into. So um, it's a really challenging time. I think folks are obviously just incredibly fatigued and it's one thing to deal with the work stress. And then unfortunately, it's another thing to get caught up in, you know, just the community tension and divisiveness all of us get um, engaged in many a conversations outside of work with lots of very vehement opinions and some unfortunately very um, derogatory about, you know, the health system driving a lot of these issues. And, and there were some challenges to that press conference yesterday, very vocally that those numbers are being embellished, made up for a variety of reasons. And it really just disenfranchises even more so um, our medical staff and our hospital staff. So it's a, as Terry pointed out, it's a really difficult time and a place. We're doing everything we can to try to prop people up and support them, but it's so hard because we need every one of them. And as soon as I say, you know, take some time and try to take care of yourself, I'm turning around saying, can you work extra today? Because <laughs> we just, we just don't have, you know, we just don't have enough staff. Um, our emergency room is getting closer to looking like, unfortunately, the pictures you've seen in the past on the nightly news. The hallways are constantly full. Uh, we have 40 beds in the emergency room. Our census at any given time has been between 60 and 102, um, with uh, at a minimum probably 10 holding for admission and as high as 35 um, holding for admission. So we're just doing this hamster wheel of trying to get people stabilized and discharged so we can fill those beds um, right up. We've got a bunch of tactics we're using trying to get people assessed. Christine, I know Brett reached out to you. We're trying to figure out some creative ways to offload some of the walk-in testing stuff. But as you know, we're um, governed by a, a federal regulation called EMTALA that requires us to anybody presents to the emergency room to at least do a medical screening exam um, before we can make a decision about if they really need to be seen. And so um, that burden alone is really just adding to our backlog um, in the emergency department. So um, we spend the majority of our days, uh, I appreciate you talking about that company, Terry. We, we've had a little bit of mixed, uh, mixed feelings about what mission control came to be. Um, but we understand our rural health colleagues are in just a terrible spot, but we're also internally kind of mission controlled, just trying to figure out how we manage these um, kind of hourly challenges, literally, because as soon as you kind of get a plan, that plan is usually dependent on resources. And we've got, you know, an unstable resource pool with the impact of the positivity rates, burnout and, and illness that we're seeing. So. Um, it's really a, a unique and an incredibly challenging um, time, but our commitment is as strong as ever to try to be there for the community and uh, we're doing our best. Brett um, crafted a, a letter and has done, uh, I think, a video. Uh, we've we've kind, of, kind of walked this careful line. We feel a need to tell our story to our own personal community, but it's hard to tell a story like what I've just shared with you all to a broader audience without it being perceived or depicted in a variety of different ways. And so we're still trying to get that right, but we think it's critically important that this has gone far beyond a conversation just about COVID, but it's about a community's access to healthcare. And, and we were becoming somewhat of a regional center for particularly our service area out to the east. And I think we had 780 declinations for transfers um, over some relatively short period of time, which is contributing to the very sad statistics that Terry reported on about people succumbing, um, you know, in communities where they just can't get um, transferred. There's just literally no room uh, or providers in the end um, to take care of them. So it uh, has just a kind of a series of unfortunate self-fulfilling scenarios that are really difficult. We're all a little confused on the Omicron Delta data as well. We feel like most of the 
acute hospitalizations uh, that we see at least at serious to critical is still probably Delta, but it's certainly in transition to Omicron. And we think the surge in our emergency and our outpatient departments is heavily driven uh, probably more by the Omicron variant uh, with the, the Delta still causing severe respiratory disease and probably driving it. We do not have uh, any genomic testing equipment in our system and it's very limited um, to be able to determine accurately and timely uh, variant. So all we still know day to day um, is it's Delta and we're kind of learning kind of what we think maybe Omicron versus Delta looks like clinically in most patients, but uh, we don't really have capacity or resources that um, are making that testing readily available to us. It has some repercussions for some of the monoclonal antibody therapy um, now that the FDA has uh, put some more stringent restrictions on uh, depending upon what the presence of Delta versus Omicron is in, in your um, in your community. So we had a long discussion today about how to try to manage um, uh, that scenario amongst many others. So, so anyway, um, I, I like uh, Steve's quote, uh, Terry, I, I was struggling with what I needed to do when I went back in to the hospital on, on New Year's Eve. And I just felt the need to say something. And so instead of a bunch of COVID data update, I, I just sent a short message out to our medical staff and, and I, I picked the words um, grace, tolerance, and patience um, and focused on those in, in my message and just owned that we were making difficult decisions every hour of every day. Uh, and some were going to affect them and their different disciplines in, in a variety of ways. And, I acknowledge that that may not be what they were hopeful or desirous would happen, but that we were going to do the best we could and continue to do so. So um, I guess unprecedented is probably the right uh, overall word. So I'm so proud of what everybody who's left standing uh, today is doing and still trying to do. And um, I think we're just hopeful we can kind of hold it out a few more weeks here and that the projections will really plateau and and hopefully wean off quickly. You know, there's some data out of some of the other um, uh, countries that suggest that um, that the uh, end of the plateaus hasn't decreased quite as quickly um, as maybe some of the previous surges. So um, we could still not be at the peak and have a, a slow slow decline. But I'm hoping that those statistical numbers don't pan out and maybe we peak sooner and uh, we get some relief soon. So a lot of words said there. I know it's uh, it's hard to know how to a group like this to articulate it. So hopefully that was helpful. Hey, Dr. Yeah. Ruddy, Jason. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I think the community community is very fortunate to have both Dr. Morris and Dr. Nelson and pre, you guys. Uh, Part of, I mean, we all have neighbors that that are hesitant about some of the issues around this pandemic, and I really, uh, you know, as you look at at what convinces people to to ponder some of these issues and maybe engage differently, I keep, you know, you go back to it's their primary care provider, and and I think it's 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 neighbors and family, and and so I I really think having you all available to uh, speak to the issue of, of, of the situation and in independence in Eastern Jackson County is, is more persuasive than, than statewide proclamations from health departments and such, and, and not diminishing any of those, anybody else's efforts. But I, I just appreciate you all uh, being up to date and forthright uh, because I think, I think that's persuasive uh, to to some of our neighbors that that struggle with with making the right decisions in, in this point in time, um, I, I hope the message is loud and clear to those that may tune in or watch this online or whatever. But I mean, a, a, the people reconsider getting vaccinated or getting their boosters, and and if you're having your illnesses that are what are the normal fare of life of broken bones and, and stomach aches and heart attacks, uh, they need to be prepared for, for uh, 
an extended situation because of the the difficulties our hospitals are having. And and I I think that the message that you provide helps prepare even those that are vaccinated and may not be challenged by COVID, but are looking to get assistance in our healthcare system now and for the foreseeable future that they need to be prepared for a different experience. Uh, my my final question, I guess, might be: Can somebody provide guidance on how citizens should access tests? I, I'm aware there's a shortage. Uh, there's difficulties with different institutions offering them. So, how how do we advise our neighbors for for getting testing when they they feel like they they may have have COVID? And I'll go back on mute and back on the road. Yeah, I guess I appreciate the comments, Jason. And from my perspective, I guess the message that we really are are pleading with um, everyone about is is to not use the emergency room um, as your source to get tested. It, it, it encompassed a full 10 to 15 percent of the past three days of peak visits into our emergency department. And that that just snowballs our challenges. I, I know people are anxious and they want to know and in some instances need to know. But the emergency department, if you're generally not acutely ill um, from the standpoint of, you know, short of breath, high fever, you're not in an ultimately high risk group, um, I'd like it not to be there. What I'd like to have then is a resource to then direct you to. And essentially all of those now are struggling to access testing. And that's a, that's a doubly bad spot because I'm saying, please don't come to the hospital, but I'm telling you, I don't really know where to have you go. And so I don't know if there's any new updates. I know our CEO is working with a resource of the federally qualified health department in Buckner that may have some grant money and some access. I know Christina has been trying to access some testing, but it's been limited there. Um, but as you've heard, the, the resources, even within our traditional laboratories, are becoming scarce. And so um, it, it's a real challenge. And I don't like not having a good direction, but, but I would just ask that people consider not heading to the emergency room, which is completely out of scope for me um, to say, unless they're, unless they're having symptoms that suggest that's really what they need. But, but we have multiple people walking up every hour that are fine, but are just worried and want to be tested. And we're just not going to be able to sustain that at the rate that our ER visit growth is coming at us. I think, I think Dr. Dana Hawkinson at, at KU uh, addressed that. And, and his, his point is really uh, pretty valid. And that's if you think you may have COVID, you probably do. So behave like you have COVID and don't be around other people and self-isolate and try to find a test and, you know, call your primary care provider, uh, check online and see if you can find it. Uh, if you're sick enough where you think you need to be in the hospital, then you got to go visit Dr. Nelson, who will greet you at the door smiling, I'm sure. But uh, it may be the flu. But every year, 40 to 60,000 people die of influenza, except last year when we didn't see any flu because everybody was wearing a mask. So even if it's the flu, you don't want to give that to other people. It obviously has impacts on your workplace, but most employers don't want you there with the flu either. You know, they don't want you there if you're infectious of a cell respiratory illness. So I, I thought his point, you know, as an infectious disease specialist was was pretty apropos that if your neighbors think that they may have COVID, then they need to treat themselves and their family as if they have COVID and search and your primary care providers, a good place to start. Any more updates? Those were that was pretty dang thorough. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, 
is there anything else we need? Um, I don't have the agenda in front of me, Christina. I'm, I'm, I, is there anything else uh, for us to address this evening? There is nothing else else on the agenda. So if if any member has something, that would be one thing. Otherwise, we are done with our agenda. That's great. People have had long days. And so uh, great discussion. But let's let them get home and, and get some rest <laughs> and enjoy whatever evening they have left. So uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So move. Second. Second. Um, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 So moved. Hey, aye. hey, folks. Thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you all. Good night. Take care. Thanks, Christina.